Okay, so you started the recording, good. Okay, well, as Jim mentioned, my talk tonight is on Hohokaban members, rock art and ideology. Now, I know a lot of people are very interested in Membris pottery from southwestern New Mexico, and I'll show you a few slides of that, but I am going to be focusing on uh, rock art tonight. So the area we're talking about is shown in your lower right of your slide, Arizona and New Mexico. The Hohokam area is in south central Arizona. The Membris area is in southwestern New Mexico. So many of us are familiar with the classic members black on white pottery tradition that arose in southwestern New Mexico between about 1000 and 1130 CE. This is the kind of pottery, most of which has very illustrative representational figures of animals and peoples doing various things, uh, sometimes very interesting things. Probably fewer of you are familiar with the red on buff and red on brown pottery tradition of Southern Arizona's Hohokam culture, which lasted longer than the members culture. The members culture is actually a subdivision of the Mugion culture of New Mexico and Southeastern Arizona. The Hohokam culture is a separate culture uh, farther west of there. The Hohokam culture, as we recognize it uh, as archeologists lasted from about four or 500 CE to about 1450 CE. The members culture, classic members culture, which I'll be talking about tonight, only spanned the period from about 1000 to 1130. So I'll talk more about that in a minute. Uh, some of the members pottery is geometric in design. And if you do comparisons side by side, you can see some similarities of Membris and Hohokam pottery design. Sometimes the similarities are rather vague. Um, a characteristic of a lot of Membris pottery is the fine line hatcher lines like you see in this bowl here. You see that also in the Hohokam example there. And there's some similarities in layouts. Uh, some pottery has anthropomorphic figures like these. Some Hohokam and members pottery also has animal figures like you see here. So just to give you a few examples here. So hopefully you can see a little bit of similarities as well as some differences in those examples. But we also see some major differences between some Hohokam and members pottery. Uh, one of the big differences is that the Hohokam use of life forms, animal and people designs in pottery only occurred between about 800 and 1000, maybe as late as 1100 CE. In the Membris area, the life form depictions were from about 1000 to 1130. So there's barely some overlap there. Another major difference is the period in each culture during which straight line geometric pottery designs were common. And each of those cultures, Hohokam and Membris, does have geometric straight line pottery. But in the Membris area, again, it's only between about 1000 and 1130. Whereas in the Hohokam area, the straight line geometric designs only became the rule really common after 1100. So they don't really overlap the period of Membris geometric designs. Now, I'd like to acknowledge uh, these images that I just showed you. Um, all of the members' pottery drawings are from the book Treasured Earth, which is a biography of Hattie Cosgrove, an archaeologist who used to work for the Peabody Museum at Harvard. And 
All of the, whole, the whole Hogan pottery images are from William Deaver and from the Arizona State Museum. And if those of you who are not muted could please mute yourself and you know, we could hear some of your background. We'd appreciate it. Now, pottery wasn't the only art medium in Hohokam and members' cultures. Another really important vehicle for cultural expression was rock art and specifically petroglyphs. Petroglyphs are designs that are etched or pecked or incised or ground into rock faces. A uh, counterpart of that is pictograph designs, which in which colors are added to the rock, you know, usually with, through painting or with charcoal staining. Um, the members classic period from 1000 to 1130, the rock art and that of the contemporaneous Hohokam culture in that same period helped define the Western limit of members art and ideology. There are certain petroglyph images that are shared by Hohokam and members. However, each culture did create motifs that apparently were not or were rarely produced by the other culture. So we can compare some shared and unshared rock art images and other aspects of both the Hohokam and members cultures to suggest similarities and differences in perhaps their respective religious beliefs and practices. Now we, we kind of assume as archeologists and as rock art researchers that both the members and the Hohokam rock art figures like the items found in the ceramics of each of those cultures probably represent images and meanings that are derived from mythological and cosmological narratives. They're not just graffiti. They're not just uh, like newspapers written on the rock. You've probably heard the term newspaper rock. It's really a misnomer. Um, ethnographic studies suggest that rock art is something that's often considered sacred by Native American people. So it does have a highly religious context to it. So the rock symbols that people left behind may help us interpret some differences in the ideologies of these two ancient Southwestern cultures. Now we have some limitations on doing a comparative rock art study like this. Uh, first of all, uh, I mentioned pictographs, but I'm not gonna be showing you any pictographs tonight because pictographs are extremely rare in the Hohokam area and very rare in the Membrus area. So I'm gonna be focusing on petroglyphs rather than pictographs. Secondly, petroglyphs are very difficult to date. You can't take a carbon 14 date on a petroglyph because you have to have some kind of organic material to get a carbon 14 date. Uh, petroglyphs are just rock images. They don't have any carbon in them normally. So you can't get a radiocarbon date on them. And there's very few other means of dating them. Certain petroglyphs in the Hohokam and members areas are attributed to their respective cultures based primarily on similarities with pottery design style and imagery. Other petroglyphs in the same locational context as the similar styled ones, therefore are usually assumed to be of the same age and cultural affiliations as the ones that we can see the same images on the pottery. A third limitation of the study is that not all Southern New Mexico petroglyph sites are member sites. I mentioned that members is a subdivision of the Mugion culture, which lasted much longer before and after members culture. So you have to weed out petroglyphs that we don't think relate specifically to the members culture. So this map gives you an idea. The Membrus area is primarily in southwestern New Mexico over here, but the Mugion area extends westward all the way into Arizona and eastward into West Texas and southward into Mexico. So we need to focus just on glyphs that we think are classic Membrus glyphs. And these are usually identified by similarities in the motifs on Membrus pottery. Now, many petroglyph symbols in the members area are common throughout that Hornada Miguel culture area of Southern New Mexico, but we don't think that all these images are members petroglyphs. 
So this is a map showing basically what we're talking about as the core of the Membrus area, the Membrus Valley, which is shaded in light green here, and the Membrus River that runs through it. The Membrus River um, originates in the mountains here at the north end of the Membrus Valley, runs for several miles, and then as it gets out into the desert floor down around Deming, New Mexico, it basically runs into the sand. It doesn't flow into any other larger river. So the map on the right shows you the basic area we're talking about. So to focus on membrous symbols, I'm only going to be discussing petroglyphs from specific membrous valley sites that include rock art designs similar to the images on membrous black on white pottery. And these sites include the Fluorite Ridge, Frying Pan Canyon, McGee Canyon, and Pony Hills petroglyph sites near Cook's Peak, which is right here on the eastern edge of the Membrous Valley, and the Nan Ranch site, which is a little farther up the valley alongside the Membrous River. But you'll see quite a few petroglyphs from these sites. Now, a fourth limitation of a study like this is that not all Southern Arizona petroglyph sites are Hohokam sites. Uh, there is a long history of petroglyph creation in southern Arizona and, in fact, throughout the western United States, beginning probably as early as six to 8,000 BCE during what we call the Archaic period. And most of those designs are kind of an abstract style, like you see illustrated here. You normally don't have representational designs in this western archaic style. So we basically need to throw out all of these glyphs that we can fairly confidently identify as Western archaic style glyphs if we're gonna be talking about Hohokam glyphs. So let's go through a few petroglyph images that are fairly common in both Hohokam and membrous cultures. First of all, some full-bodied anthropomorph. Anthropomorph is just a term for human shaped and we use that term as opposed to saying human designs because we don't know whether the makers intended to be depicting actual people or perhaps in some cases they may have been depicting deities. And hopefully you'll get that impression as I go through here tonight. So some examples of full-bodied anthropomorphs in the Hohokam culture. You have these three that the arrows point to. And when I'm talking about full-bodied anthropomorphs, I'm talking about human-shaped designs that are not stick figures. They're full, you know, wide-body figures like you see here. You also see a number of those in members' culture in various positions. Another example here, kind of a full-bodied anthropomorph with arms and legs and a head. One over here, you know, it's not a stick figure, even though it's kind of hollow. Both of these cultures have images of anthropomorphs holding staffs. Um, a lot of Native American cultures in the American Southwest and way down into Mexico to the South use staffs to identify people in authority of something. So that might be what some of these staffs symbolize in some of the ancient petroglyph sites here in the Southwest. So you can see an example here, person holding a staff or anthropomorph holding a staff, similarly over here. Another example here, anthropomorph holding staff, anthropomorph holding staff. Headdressed anthropomorphs, um, some kind of feather designs or cap designs, you know, some kind of headgear. It's fairly common in both Hohokam and members cultures. You know, the headdresses may vary from one item to another. This one is probably a stylized anthropomorph with a headdress over here on the left. This one might indicate some kind of either feathers or antler type of headgear, who knows. Bighorn sheep designs are very common in both of these cultures. Lizards designs, you know, usually stick figure, but not always. Sometimes you can't tell whether these designs really represent lizards or perhaps an anthropomorph with a long sexual organ. Right? And there's been some debate about whether designs that are commonly called lizards might actually be male uh, anthropomorphs. 
you know, I won't go into that in too much detail. But a, a kind of a difference is that most of the membrous lizards appear to represent the horn toad, the horny toad, you know, the really fat lizard with the scales, you know, alongside its belly. Whereas most holocom lizards are in fact the stick figure type, like you see on the left here. But there are some full-bodied lizards in Hohokam sites that some have suggested might represent the Gila monster. This one here probably represents a horned toad. These very likely represent Gila monsters, you know, the very fat lizard with the short clubby tail. Simple snake or zigzag or meandering lines are common in both Hohokam and members culture. Some snakes are more obviously snakes than others. Some are just zigzag lines and you have to make an interpretation that they might represent snakes. They could represent something else like lightning or a landscape horizon, hard to say. The simple snakes seem to be more common in Hohokam glyphs than in membrous ones. The membrous ones tend to be more complex. There is a dot and circle design, which kind of looks like a bullseye design. Those are fairly common in both Hohokam and members cultures. Some of them have elaborations. Some of them have rays suggesting they might represent a sun or a star or perhaps the moon with light radiating out from it. That's an interpretation we make today may not necessarily be correct. There's also designs that are concentric circles that don't have dots in the center, common to both cultures. There are simple scroll designs and I'm distinguishing a scroll from a spiral by saying that the scroll has an extended outer end. So to give you some examples here, this one on the left is scrolling into another scroll. This one, you know, the, the spiral is spiraling outside of the actual coil. So it's a simple scroll design. You also commonly see interlocking scrolls in both of these cultures, Hohokam and Membrus. Now, something that's also common in petroglyph sites of both of these cultures are bedrock mortars, which were probably used for grinding mesquite tree bean pods or making flour. Uh, mesquite trees are prevalent throughout both of these regions. And we know historically that people did use mesquite beans as a major food source and that they used mortars like this to process the mesquite pods. But interestingly, a lot of these mortars are associated with petroglyph sites. Also cupules, which are usually kind of very small versions of mortars and matates or grinding slicks in which you know, people use a back and forth motion on the rock to grind something. So those are all common in both Hohokam and members sites. These are examples of cupules, the really smaller ones and some grinding slicks. These both happen to be at Hohokam sites. Now, there are also images that are present in both members and Hohokam sites, but that are not common in either one. They're un uncommon in both. These include such things as crescent designs, which could represent headdresses, could represent rainbows, could represent a crescent moon. Again, it's a matter of interpretation, but they are crescent designs. Yeah, they do occur in both cultures. Simple crescent over here simple crescent over here that many people would interpret as a moon design. In each culture, you occasionally find concentrations of large dots, you know, Hohokam on the left, Membrus on the right. There is a design featuring a cross or an X inside of a circle that occurs in both of these culture areas, not really common in either one. There are mask or face designs that appear to have two horns, like maybe a bison or a deer antler type of headgear. 
left is a HOCOM, right is Membrus. Some designs look like centipedes. You see these in both cultures, not too common. Designs that some people might interpret as corn plants. I think this is a pretty tenuous interpretation that some people make that interpretation. Handprint designs occur in both cultures, but they're not very common in either one. Now there are some uh, petroglyph images that are far more common in member sites than Hohokam. So notice the kind of purplish heading here to set these apart from the ones I've just been showing you. Membrous commonalities include rattlesnake designs. Uh, rattlesnake designs do occur in Hohokam sites like this one on the left. You can see a really fat bodied snake with a head with the two eyes left unpecked over here. But this one in the members area is really explicit. You can tell for sure it's a rattlesnake. The horned feather, horned serpent or feathered or plumed serpent. Um, as far as I know, I have never seen this in any Hohokam petroglyph sites. Here's an example at one of the member sites, the horned serpent, it's this kind of zigzag figure here that looks like it has a horn on top of the head. And this symbol is also common farther south in Mexico. Now, the horned serpents, in, which is also prominent in later Pueblo Indian solstice rituals, it often is depicted with stars and sometimes with cloud symbols, which look like stepped uh, pyramid type designs. So some modern Pueblo people, traditional Pueblo people, interpret this as an image of Quetzalcoatl, the uh, feathered serpent or the horned serpent in Aztec culture in Mesoamerica. Birds are more common in members petroglyphs than in Hohokam sites. Uh, these might include the Thunderbird type, which most modern Pueblo Indians would say represents a hawk or an eagle. Um, I don't have too many Thunderbird-like images from Hohokam sites. This is about the closest I could find, which doesn't really look like a Thunderbird to me. The one on the right here from the members looks very much more like a Thunderbird type stylized design. Macaws or parrot designs, uh, extremely rare in Hohokam sites if they occur at all. I do not know of any clear examples in Hohokam sites. But you do find sites in um, member sites that apparently do represent macaws. This one with the thick beak here and the fairly long tail. Another example here, thick beak. Spread wings, long tail. There's also a bird type that Mark Thompson has referred to as the knife wing type of bird design, which I've never seen in Hohokam sites. It's a very distinctive bird design with very sharp pointed wings facing down. And you see this on a number of members of petroglyph sites. Water dwelling creatures like fish, turtles, tadpoles, and frogs are extremely rare in Hohokam petroglyphs. They are really quite common in membrous petroglyphs. Some examples here you see the fish design with the fins and the tail. Turtle. Unfortunately, its head has been shot off by somebody vandalizing this site. Another probable turtle petroglyph. Tadpole-like designs here, you know, just forming into frogs perhaps here. More tadpoles here. These are all members designs. A lot of tadpole-like designs. So apparently people had a big fascination with these and perhaps full-fledged frog designs, frog or toad. Insects and arachnids, you know, spiders, ticks, things like that. Um, once in a while, you'll see things that look like insects or arachnids in Hohokam sites, extremely rare, and I don't have a good picture of the one I know about here, but I'm told somebody really interprets this as a scorpion glyph, which is a type of arachnid. 
Insect designs are much more common in membrane sites. This one is often interpreted as a dragonfly motif. Rabbit designs. Rarely in Hoacom sites, if at all, uh, the, the image here, it's questionable whether this is a rabbit because it has such long um, ears or are they horns and it has long legs, which might indicate that it's a mountain sheep. Here's a rabbit design from a member site associated with a moon design. This one looks like a rabbit who's fishing for something. The rabbit over here, a line extending between it and some other creature over on the right. Long-tailed quadrupeds, four-footed animals, possibly a lion or a coatamundi. Now, coatamundi is an animal that's more common in Mexico, but it does occur in Southern Arizona and Southern New Mexico. I'm not aware of any hohokam examples. There are several members examples of these long skinny tailed animals, which could represent either one of these, kawadi or um, mountain lion. A human shaped mask or a face without a body, common in member sites not common in Hoacom sites. Basically just an oval with maybe an eyes, a couple of eyes and a mouth. A mask or a simple face design with a simple stylized body, often just a single line or a double line extending down from the face. Also very rare in Hoacom sites more common in member sites. You know, this one might be interpreted as a goggle-eyed face with a very minimal body on it. This one just has a very linear body extending down from the face. Another example here, some people might interpret this as a beard uh, extending down from the face of the mask. There is a helmet type animal head mask feature in members pet uh, petroglyphs. Um, I've seen one example, I've actually seen two examples in Hoacom sites where it looks like an anthropomorph that has a bird beak for a head. Very rare though in Hoacom sites. More common in member sites. The goggle-eyed anthropomorph. Um, this is actually not too uncommon in Hoacom sites if you interpret this as a pair of eyes with a face, which is questionable. But you see a lot of goggle-eyed figures in some of the members art. This one here, you can see the goggle eyes right here within a face and a big wide body with a geometric design in the upper body part. More goggle eyes here with apparently a stylized uh, body garment of some sort. A very characteristic member's design is what I call the dot and diamond eye shape. I do not know of any Hoacom examples of this. Here you can see it is the dot eye within a diamond shape, you know, for the sclera or the white part of the eye. And we see this very often in Hoacom pottery as well, both in animals and in people representations. Another example of the dot and diamond eye design. That is a very obvious members type design by comparison with the pottery. We don't see that in Hohokam pottery either. It's, it's more common to see facial features in members petroglyphs than it is in Hohokam sites. The eyebrows, the noses, uh, other facial features are much more common in members sites than they are in Hohokam petroglyphs. 
So you see some fairly detailed facial features here of this reclining figure with you know, very awesome teeth in the mouth. Another example of fierce looking teeth with goggle eyes and even eyebrows on this one. Maybe an ear sticking off here on the left side. Human footprints, extremely rare in Hoacom sites, fairly common in member sites. You see footprints here, here going across from right to left. There's a couple in here that are kind of hard to see right here in the middle. and some running up the rock here. A design that looks kind of like a drumstick or a hafted axe, an axe head on a handle. I don't know of many examples of these in either culture, but the only ones I've seen are in members culture. Geometric blanket-like designs do occur in Hohokam sites, usually in sites that are later than Hohokam or later than the members classic period. So after 1130, but geometric blanket designs are quite common in membrous anthropomorph figures. The burden basket design. Uh, this is common in members culture, not at all common or maybe non-existent in Hohokam petroglyphs. This is the burden basket. It looks kind of like a Gemini space capsule for those of you old enough to remember what those looked like. But typically, um, Pueblo and Indian women traditionally would carry large baskets like this on their back and carry huge loads with them. And you often see this in membrous pottery depictions, you know, with women, women actually carrying these baskets on their back. And you occasionally see it in membrous petroglyphs. The cloud terrace or step design is much more common in members culture than in Hohokam culture. So the step design, this is a very good example, you know, like steps running up maybe to an apex, maybe sometimes down the other side. So it looks like it might be a mountain that has terraced edges on it. Uh, this is often interpreted as a cloud design by modern Puebloan peoples. It's also interpreted as a mountain design by modern Pueblo people. And they associate both of those symbols with rain. So it's a very important design in modern Pueblo culture. But you see it quite a lot in members culture. Step design here. Step design here in the, what looks like the fabric of this goggle-eyed feature. What I call the pointillist fill within outlines is very rarely seen in Hohokam sites. You can kind of see how this petroglyph on the left, which is a Hohokam site, has been partly filled in by pecking the rock in the interior of this rectangle. Uh, this dotted design as a fill is much more common in members petroglyphs than it is in Hohokam glyphs. Another example here, a nice anthropology for more for the pointillist, you know, you know, filled in dotted design. An arrow with a widened point without a bow. I have only seen these in members petroglyphs, never in Hohokam petroglyphs. And for that, we're talking about this symbol over here on the left, just a line with a barbed arrow point on the top of it. Another example right here. Now, a key member's motif is the outlined cross design. That occasionally occurs in Hohokam sites. It's relatively rare. Um, it occurs quite often in the members area petroglyphs. As an example here, you have the cross shape that's outlined, you know, not enclosed on the ends in this particular example. You also see these outline cross designs very commonly on members pottery. So that appears to be a typical member symbol. 
some other examples here. This is a double outline cross. You also see kind of a crisscross design in HOACOM. But again, it's very rare in HOACOM sites compared to members. Another example here, outline cross on the members site. Outline cross down here on the members site. There's one over here. The bear paw design. I don't know of any HOHOCOM examples. It's fairly common in members culture as well as Mugion culture in general, you know, throughout uh, southwestern New Mexico and southern New Mexico. You see it right here as well. Another example over here. Some kind of a cat's paw design, probably representing a mountain lion or bobcat footprint. I don't know of any Hohokam examples. I've seen some really nice members examples. This one, you have a series of five of them right here overlying a deer petroglyph or some kind of quadruped. The quadruped's head is right here. Uh, it's kind of facing up instead of facing sideways. So you have the body here with these five cat paw footprint designs on the, the animal itself, suggesting the cat has attacked the animal. So let me highlight them for you here real quickly. Glyphs that look like bird tracks. Um, extremely rare, again, in HOACOM sites. Relatively common in member sites. Examples here, most of them have free toes on them. You know, hard to tell what kind of bird it might represent. Uh, people often suggest they're turkey tracks, which certainly could be. The members did keep turkeys. Have some more examples here. So there are other designs that are much more common in Hohokam petroglyph sites than in member sites. So notice the change in color here for my headings. Stick figure anthropomorph designs, extremely common in Hohokam petroglyph styles. You know, just a stick figure, sticky arms and legs, maybe an enlarged head, sometimes with an enlarged midbody. Typically, the, the stick figure anthropomorphs in Hohokam sites do not have emphasized fingers and toes. You do have stick figure anthropomorphs in member sites, but they're relatively rare compared to the full body figures. You have a full body figure here with the dotted diamond eye. The stick figure here, which might represent an anthropomorph, it's really hard to tell even whether that's what it is. Kind of a stick figure here, but pretty wide sticks. A lot of the stick figures in the Hohokam petroglyphs have upraised arms as if they're supplicating to the heavens. Some of them have headgear or hairstyles on them. Some of them appear to be gender specific, male or female. Uh, these ones here with kind of the open or folded legs are often interpreted to represent female anthropomorphs, whereas the extended legs are often interpreted to represent male. Some variations on stick figures in Hohokam. Uh, some of them are quite elaborate, you know, with triangular bodies in addition to the stick figures. Member stick figure anthropomorphs with its emphasized fingers and toes apparently are rare or absent. You know, the emphasized digits are occasionally seen in Hohokam petroglyphs. I have never seen one in a member's petroglyph. Here's an example from a Hohokam site near Tucson, with the emphasized toes and fingers. Another one here, different site. Another example. 
connected hand-holding anthropomorphs. Uh, these probably represent lines of anthropomorphic figures, probably humans in a dance formation. Um, you can see these today. If you visit some of the Pueblos on feast days in the Southwest, you'll often have groups of dancers that do line dances holding hands like this as part of their religious ceremonies. Now the Hohokam ones usually don't have masks or faces that are emphasized. They might have headdresses, but none of the facial features. Another example here, you know, connected figures. They may have horns or other headgear, but no recognizable caps like that horn serpent that you see in Memrus. See how they're holding hands here? Quite a number of examples of these in Hohokam sites. Bow and arrow designs, you know, not the single arrow like I showed you for member sites with just the barb on one end, but you have actual bow designs that looks like they have arrows crossing the bows in Hohokam sites. Not that common, but they do occur. Um, rarely you'll see things that look kind of like that in member sites. You know, this is probably the only one I remember seeing that remotely looks like a bow and arrow. Another example here had a Hohokam site, the bow here with the arrow pointing upward. Another example here. And there has been at least one identified glyph in a Hohokam site of perhaps a person using a blowgun. This is the only example I know of, but it's this one here in the Phoenix area. Never seen that in members petroglyphs. There is a uniquely Hohokam petroglyph image that has been termed the pipette image named after the chemistry tool that's used to suck liquids up to transfer liquids from one vial to another. And that's this design here. It's, it's basically two lines that have flaps going out and in. And the more elaborate ones like you see here usually have two small circles under a set of the flaps that might depict eyes on this figure here, but this is called a pipette. Another example here, see the flaps on it? Another one here. Really nice examples here. So you don't see these in the members rock art. There's a design that archeologist Aaron Wright has termed a yoke design. And it's very much like the breast cancer awareness ribbon that you see here. You know, it's a looped design. Sometimes it just ends in the, the lines here. Sometimes it angles upward like these two do. Um, these are not common in Hohokam sites by any means. And they're actually more common to the west of the Hohokam culture area. But I've never seen anything like this symbol in any members petroglyph sites. Another example of a simple yoke design over here. Spiral designs, very common in Hohokam petroglyphs. You do see spirals in members petroglyphs, but they're not nearly as common as they are in Hohokam sites. There's a recent study uh, northwest of the Tucson area where one of my friends was recording all the petroglyphs and he identified a site that had nearly 50% of the petroglyph symbols were spirals on this site. So very high percentages in some cases, most of them don't have quite that large a percentage with spirals on them. And some of these spirals are quite elaborate on Hohokam sites. Now, a number of the Hohokam petroglyph spirals have been confirmed as calendar reckoning images in which you have displays of sun, sunlight and shadow mark certain parts of the spirals at the equinoxes, sometimes at the solstices, and sometimes at other times of the year. I don't know of any member sites that have this feature. This is a spiral design here that has what's called a sun dagger occurring on the summer solstice morning. 
the I same I one. They were starting at a different time now, so I'm listening to it. But I'm ready. I this is the same spiral I showed you in the previous slide on the equinoxes. This occurs on both the spring and the fall equinoxes with a much narrower sun dagger pointing right into the center of the spiral. This is one west of Tucson in Saguaro National Park West in which you have a shadow pointer uh, pointing to the center of the spiral. And I'm told by a fellow researcher, Brad Schaefer, that this one also has a sun dagger appear on it a little earlier than this shadow pointer does. Now, some other rock art attributes that apparently are more common in the Hohokam area than the Membrus area. Now, there's a number of them, so I'm just gonna kind of summarize them real quickly here. Sun-like circles, spirals, or asterisks with rays extending outward. You see a, a number of variations on designs like this. There are reticulate or net-like designs in Hohokam sites. You know, none of these are really common in membrous sites. Deer designs, you know, things that are obviously deer with an antler rack facing forward or upright. Sometimes you see animals that appear to be fantasy or unidentifiable animals, you know, like a deer with a long curly tail. You know, that's kind of a fantasy animal. Uh, this one, a lot of people have commented, looks like a wallaby from Australia, but it's on a Hohokam petroglyph site. Flower-like designs, you know, flowers on stems as well as the petal arrays. Water birds that probably represent the great blue heron, like you see depicted here. Uh, these are common in a lot of the Hohokam petroglyph sites closer to the, the major rivers in southern Arizona, the Gila and the Salt River. Nested chevrons and nested zigzag designs are fairly common in Hohokam sites. And what I call a palimpsest in which petroglyphs are superimposed on one another through time. You know, you have an original glyph put on a rock, uh, later on somebody comes on, executes a new glyph that partly over, overwrites the previous glyph. So it's like a palimpsest on uh, sheepskin, you know, it's been used for many times for many purposes. You get new messages all the time. Um, very rare to see something like that in members petroglyphs. Now, as far as conclusions on this, you know, I was talking about religious ideology. What can we say about people's worldview and their religious ideology? And you have to incorporate other things from archeology span to be able to make interpretations like this. So if you look at some of the details of the actual boundaries of what we recognize as Hohokam, this dashed line here is basically the core area of the Hohokam in which ball courts, you know, these stadium-like features that are typical Hohokam uh, arenas occur. And the outer dotted line here is the distribution of shell ornaments and artifacts, you know, probably originated in the Gulf of California, but brought into Southern Arizona, worked into ornaments and jewelry up here, and then distributed outward through the Hohokam area and even beyond. So this gives you an idea of the boundaries of the Hohokam culture area. If you extend that into the Membrus area, the actual Membrus Valley is extremely small compared to that large Hohokam area. But you see Membrus pottery and Membrus petroglyphs extending down almost to the international boundary with Mexico, almost to the, the, the western boundary in New Mexico, the boundary with Arizona, and northward up into the mountains north of the Membrus Valley, and eastward all the way to the Rio Grande, you know, the major drainage that goes through New Mexico. But still, that entire area that, where you see typical Membrus pottery and other Membrus artifacts is much smaller than the much broader Hohokam area. So if you look at other features such as public architecture, and ceramics, this might help uh, determine whether rock art can help define the geographic limits of the members and Hohokam art and ideology. These are some maps of some member sites and the public architecture on most members sites is a very large pit structure that is often called a great kiva. 
And often it is constructed within or immediately adjacent to a Pueblo style room block, you know, a series of apartment like rooms with this big subterranean feature, you know, large enough to accommodate many people inside it at any one time. These are often interpreted as religious structures where religious ceremonies were performed for an entire village. This is a photograph showing uh, the actual size of one of these members great kivas. The actual kiva itself might be about a half to a third of this diameter and the rest of it represents uh, areas that have caved in because it's so deep, you know, so, you know, still it's a pretty large pit structure and very deep in a lot of these member sites. A number of these have been excavated. During this same period, the main form of public architecture apparently used for religious purposes in Hohokam villages was what archaeologists term a ball court. It's a very arena-like earthen bank structure believed to have been used for playing highly ritualized ball games, similar to the games that were played in Mesoamerica when the Spanish first came into Mexico during the conquest after 1519. So on Hohokam large village sites, uh, virtually every medium or large size Hohokam village has at least one of these ball court features on them. Uh, this is a map of the Snake Town archeological site along the Gila River, which has two ball courts. And notice they're in very prominent places on opposite sides of a central area that doesn't have any housing or other major constructed features in it. So that open area within the center is considered a central plaza area. Each one of these little dots here represents a Hohokam pit house, you know, the smaller houses. So the ball courts often off, uh, occupy a prominent space besides, beside a large open space that can be interpreted as a central village plaza. Some examples of Hohokam ball courts. Uh, this is the large ball court at Snake Town which was half excavated in the 1930s. You can see this site on the right is deeper because it was excavated out, you know, down to the floor. It had a pretty flat bottom floor with nearly vertical walls on the inside. And to give you an idea of the scale, uh, this is a two pole utility pole line next to a graded road running beside this ball court. This one is about 80 meters long. You know, it's almost as long as a modern football field. This is another view of this same ball court you know, showing it's pretty great size compared to the members great kivas. Now, archaeologists Mark Thompson, Patricia Gilman, and Christina Wyckoff, and some other archaeologists and researchers have suggested that certain images on members classic period pottery may depict characters and narratives in the Mesoamerican creation story known as the Hero Twins Saga. It's basically the creation story of cultures farther south, including the Maya. Um, their argument is that this has been, this creation story was actually recorded in a writing called the Popol Vuh, which was written by Native American scribes in the Maya area under the direction of Spanish priests after the Spanish conquest. And it's a source of the, the Mesoamerican worldview, how they were created and the so-called hero twins that were very important in defining their culture. The hero twins had to go through a series of challenges by monsters and others, including getting killed, being transformed into fish, being transformed into animals and being transformed back into humans or perhaps deities. Well, Thompson, Gilman, and Wyckoff and some others have suggested that some of the images on members pottery seem to depict a similar story. And it's not really been explained how or whether this hero twin saga relates to the great Kiva religious structures uh, that we find in member sites, you know, but it is a clear image on the members pottery designs. So just some examples. Uh, this is from an article in American Archaeology magazine that appeared a few years ago by these three authors showing what they interpret as some of the stages in the Popol Vuh story. Uh, one of them in which, you know, one of the hero twins, you know, they actually both get transformed into fish and have to go into the water underworld at some point. At some point, they're carried in a burden basket by their grandmother. They have to fight with a monster and this is very much a fantasy animal. Um, the hero twins 
if you believe that interpretation in Merberus pottery, uh, the hero twins, you know, based on Pueblo mythology, there was a dominant twin who was right-handed and a, a less dominant twin who was left-handed. And here you see a right-handed twin who is bigger than the left-handed twin here. And you don't see their other arms that are less uh, prominent. And they're also kind of subsumed under a fish in that drawing. Um, there's decapitation. The, the twins were killed in this story. You know, they were beheaded. So then they became fish. They had to make their way back into human form eventually. Now, it, it's very difficult to relate this so-called hero twins interpretation to images in Membris rock art. But there are some possible analogies in this. If you look at the outlined cross symbol that I mentioned earlier, this outlined cross symbol is very common in a lot of the members black on white pottery. And I'm just showing you a few examples here. The outline cross symbol is also very common in members rock art. So apparently this was a very important symbol to members people. Now, the reason I think that this may fit in with the so-called Popovu hero twins account that uh, Thompson and other have advocated is because in modern Pueblo beliefs about their origin stories, they talk about the twin war gods, one of whom was dominant. So is that an outtake of the Popol Vuh, just like maybe this member story was? Um, this symbol, according to these modern Pueblo peoples, represents the dominant twin in the war gods tree uh, symbol. And it represents the planet Venus, which is the name of this twin. So I think there is a possible analogy there. As far as the Hohokam religion, uh, Hokam religion appears to have been focused on the ball courts between about 800 and 1100 CE. Now, in some recent publications, a prominent archaeologist in the Hokam area, Henry Wallace, has suggested that of what Hokam religion apparently focused on ball courts was all about. He has suggested that there were some environmental and social stresses starting in the mid to late 700 CE that led to the development of an internal revitalization movement among the Hohokam. And part of his premise is that if things aren't working for your society and you keep praying to your gods and the gods are not doing anything to help you alleviate these stresses, then maybe it's time to adopt a new religion, you know, pray to somebody else and try to correct these abnormalities that are occurring to your people. You know, they're very detrimental. So he suggests that part of this movement was the formation of one or more sodalities, just a group of unrelated people that were designed to tie disparate Hohokam communities together and to coordinate water use. The Hohokam are well known for irrigation technology, especially along the Salt and Gila rivers in South Central Arizona. So he suggests that part of this uh, movement was to coordinate irrigation and to make things more productive for all the Hohokam culture. He has suggested that this so-called Hohokam revitalization movement included what he calls a package of new ritual traits distributed across the Hohokam region. The distribution, emulation or imitation of and content of design on what we call middle Gila buffware pottery, which I'll show you in a minute, and a drastic expansion of the canal systems in the Lower Salt River Valley, which is the main river running through the Hohokam area. Now the middle heel of buff wear, uh, it's usually red iron mineral paint on a buff colored background. It features abundant animal motifs and some anthropomorphic designs. And this is at least part of the inspiration for Wallace's view because this type of pottery, this design scheme on pottery became very common between about 850 and 1100. And we all see, also see uh, numbers of animal and anthropomorph designs in the Hohokam rock art. So might the Hohokam petroglyphs be another expression of this Hohokam revitalization movement that Mr. Wallace talks about?
So I'll leave you with a question on that and just conclude by saying that I believe rock art can help us define the Western limit of members art and ideology, as well as the Eastern limits of Hohokam art and ideology. Certain petroglyph images are common to both of these cultures, but each one exhibits motifs that apparently were not shared or were rarely shared by the other culture. The comparison of shared and unshared images and of other aspects of Hohokam and members cultures suggest both similarities and differences in their respective religious beliefs and practices. And this inference is supported, I think, by other kinds of archeological data, such as comparing the different kinds of public architecture in each area, the different repeated images on decorated ceramics that suggest the religious beliefs and practices of the Hohokam differed from those of the members culture. So with that, I'd like to open it up to questions and comments. Hello, if everybody can hear me, <clears throat> please add your questions into the chat feature. Um, and meanwhile, as people do that, I'll, um, I mean, I, I'm totally amazed at the connection with the Popal Vu and <clears throat> that you mentioned that and the Hero Twins. And I just wanna point out to everybody that <clears throat> In January, we're going to have a, a, a main Mayanist, Alan Christensen, uh, in our Atslander Zoom, and he'll be talking about the Popal Vu. In, in fact, he is the most recent scholarly translation of the Popal Vu that all of the other Maya scholars and researchers and grads and grad students or professors, everybody references Alan Christensen's interpretation of the Popal Vu. So if you'd be back with us in January, um, we'll have an elaboration of, of what Al is uh, alluding to. Um, and you can find his, uh, his translation is actually online. You can find it online. Yeah. And actually, um, I don't see him right now in our list of participants, but he was here. I, I admitted him earlier. I just don't see him right now. Um, but Al, what do you think the, the main gist of the petroglyphs were? Were they sort of along hunting routes where a hunter is saying, hey, I was here and I'm from the culture that lives on the other side of the mountain or is it shamanic? Oh, like they're spending the night out in their vision quest and, and but what is the main message? If, if, if somebody else could walk along a month later and see the petroglyph, there's probably a whole discourse. There's a whole symbolism that just one pictograph or one symbol would, would symbolize to say, hey, you know, but what do you think is the main, why were they communicating in this way? Well, in my opinion, in several other rock art researches, I think the main message is that there was no main message in petroglyphs. Petroglyphs appear to have been created for specific purposes at certain places and at certain times. Um, speaking for the Hohokam area, primarily, which is what I'm more familiar with. Many of the petroglyphs in Southern Arizona are associated with trails. Uh, many are associated with water sources. Many are associated with what appear to be cultural boundary areas. So for example, on some of the Western fringes of the Hohokam area where the Hohokam kind of tapered off and the Patayan culture began farther West along the lower Colorado River, there are hundreds and thousands of petroglyphs in those areas that have symbols from both of those cultures as if they're establishing this is our boundary. You know, we're putting our symbols here to show you we are here. And as you get farther west, you see more Patayan symbols. As you get farther east, you see more Hohokam symbols. So I think uh, petroglyphs can symbolize different things for different people. Individual designs, it's, it's very difficult to interpret what specific designs might have meant 
to people since we can't interview them anymore. Um, I gave you the examples of spirals, uh, some of which are calendar markers, but apparently not all spirals were calendar markers and <clears throat> different you know, peoples today, different native peoples today have different interpretations about what spirals represent. So they can represent different things to different people, but they do seem to be associated <laughs> with specific locations, geographic locations that people utilized a lot. Some of them are very public. You know, for example, if you're walking up a wash, You're muted, Alan. Sorry, what was the last thing I said? <laughs> Some of those are. <laughs> Some of those are intended to be seen by a lot of people passing by. <clears throat> but even in some of those areas, if you go back away from the wash, you'll see petroglyphs in very secluded spaces as if you know people were intentionally trying to hide them or they didn't care whether a lot of people saw them along their passage from one place to another. So I, I think the main message is that there was no single main message on petroglyphs. Yeah, there are multiple meanings involved. I found it really interesting with the ball courts out there in the Southwest. I, I, you know, I'm, with, I'm aware of the macaws and the turquoise trade and all that and the connection to Mesoamerica, but it, I didn't realize, do you think the ball court was more connection to Mesoamerica from there because of the trade routes that were coming up? Or was it a connection with the cultures, the mound builders and the Mississippian Valley mound builders? Now, my, most of the people who have done extensive research on Hohokam ball courts have concluded that they are very strongly related to the Mesoamerican courts and yeah. probably not very closely related at all to the Midwestern, okay. you know, what's now the Midwestern U.S. Okay, we have uh, Angeline Duran and... Uh, Hi, Angeline. <laughs> I asked her. To, uh, I know you. You thought you got rid of me. <laughs> no, but uh, well, now that you're here, uh, go ahead and ask your questions. I, you've got a pretty long question there that would take me a while to read. Go ahead and ask Al your you. question. Um, we can talk about this off offline as well because I'm very curious about your perspective on this. But um, so I've been. I sent you a video the other day of some images. Um, I've been studying a cave for a while over in the Cumia area. Uh, uh, the border between um, San Diego County and Imperial County and Mexico. It's Kumeyaay, um, but some of the older pictographs in this in this cave, the cave or this rock shelter, has the five-fingered child, as it's called in Mesoamerica, or um, the the five, the left-handed child. Sorry, that's what I meant to say, left-handed child or the left-handed twin, and it has the outlined. Um, cross which is often Venus and I, I that's perplexed me as well as a, as a lot of other imagery that I've seen out in that Kumeyaay tip you know uh more called Kumeyaay area um these more uh, you know Aztecan or uh, Mesoamerican style images and I don't know if you have any comment about that but I'd be interested to hear if you know anything about that uh, th this is the first I've heard anything about that, and I think Mark Thompson and Pat Gilman and Christina Wyckoff would be very interested in knowing about that if they don't know about it already, because from what you're describing to me, that also sounds very reminiscent of the Popol Vuh. And, you know, that Popol Vuh story, you know, I, I think Thompson and others have made a very good case for that being the basis of a lot of these images in membrous pottery and you know, what I'm adding slightly to members rock art, um, we don't see those images in Hohokam art, at least not that I can pick up as relating to Popol Vuh. And I have never heard of any, you know, the so-called left-handed images in the Patayan area that you're talking about, you know, farther west of the Hohokam. So I, I think that's a very interesting observation and I would like to discuss that with you further offline. All right, we've got- only a couple questions, but I've just asked, asked Brad Schaefer to unmute. Um, he goes, what do we know about positive joint ancestors of the Mimbris and uh, Mimbris and the Hohokam 
with this uh, perhaps explaining the partial overlaps of pictorial motifs that you catalog? Or can the overlap be better explained by ordinary cultural context? I, I think a lot of it can be explained by ordinary cultural contact. Um, one thing that we don't know for certain is what language group either the Hohokam or the members were part of. Uh, you may have heard of the Uto Aztecan language group, which extends from South Central Mexico all the way up through Mex Western Mexico into the Western United States. You know, it goes through Southern Arizona into what's now the former Hohokam territory and all the way up into the Great Basin with the Ute speaking peoples and the Hopi. So Uto Aztecan speakers, you know, if they're tied together by language, chances are that language has a very long history. And I think there's a good chance that both the Hohokam and at least some of the members spoke some variant of the Uto Aztecan language. If they speak variants of the same language, they probably have very similar origin stories, you know, in their language, you know, that they have the, their idea, their perspective on where they came from. Um, unfortunately, much of the origin stories of the, the modern Tohono Atham and Akamel Atham in Arizona, who are mostly believed to be the descendants of the Hohokam, um, they don't really go back so far into the early religious ideologies. And we have no stories that we know of from descendants of the members culture. We don't really know for sure what happened to the members people. You know, they apparently dispersed from their location in Southwestern New Mexico. Probably some of them went north to join the modern Pueblo groups in Northern New Mexico and Northern Arizona. Probably a large number of them instead went south to join people in the Tarahumara area, perhaps even the, the Huichol area, you know, farther down into Mexico. And we, we can't tie the origin stories of any of those peoples directly to the members people. So we, we don't really know what their beliefs were except through their imagery, which you see in the ceramics and in the, the rock art and maybe some, a few other media. Hmm. And Brad, you're unmuted. Did you have any further questions? No, uh, thank you. Good answer. And a, and a nice talk. Very well done. Thanks, Brad. <laughs> and Jeff Fisher's asking, he just says, I'm curious about the connection between the members and the Hokokoam with the people of the Casa Malpies of East Central Arizona, where many similar petroglyphs are found. Um, the Casa Malpais site is in northeastern Arizona. It's quite a distance from the members area. Both the ancestry of the Casa Malpais and the members culture area are considered kind of sub areas within the larger Mugillon culture area, the archaeological culture we identify as Mugillon. Um, but again, you know, we really don't know what happened to the members people after they dispersed from southwestern New Mexico. Um, from what I know of Casa Malpais, it is mostly the Zuni Pueblo people who claim that as an ancestral site, more so than any other modern uh, Arizona or New Mexico tribe. So the Zuni, some Zuni claim members as being ancestral to Zuni. Many Zuni claim that members is not ancestral to Zuni. So it kind of depends on who you talk to in Zuni culture as to who is ancestral and who is not. So it's hard to, in my mind, to establish a connection between Casa Malpais in Northeastern Arizona and the members culture in Southwestern New Mexico. And Casa Malpais is about an equal distance from the Hohokam area and has much less similarities with Hohokam you know, material cultures than it does with Pueblo and type culture. All right. Angeline's asking if uh, this recording will be posted somewhere and uh, Michael's putting together a new Atslander YouTube page and it'll definitely uh, be posted on our YouTube page. Um, so yes, and <clears throat> Angeline, 
uh, I'm not sure that I have your email in my contacts, but maintain contact with Al and Michael, and we'll definitely put you on our list to receive uh, notifications of when the recording's up, the at Slander newsletter, and uh, future Zoom notifications. So it's great that you were with us tonight, Angeline. Al? And I might add that this is Mike. I might add that I have the URLs for the three previous lectures on the Oslander sites on Facebook and on uh, Tumblr and on WordPress. So you can, even before I put up the YouTube sites, you can get the URLs to that on the, just go to the Oslander site on Facebook and, and you'll see the URLs for the three lectures that we've had so far. This is for the actual video recordings you're talking about? Yes. Okay. Al, Al, yes. Mark Thompson here. Thank you very much for the tour of the whole Um, I just have two quick comments. Life forms occur as early as 8800 in Membrae's style one, and they continue in style two. Right, that's correct. That, that includes both uh, knife wing as early as style one, and then lots of uh, paired fish in style two. The second is that the hero twins depicted in Mimbra's pottery um, are not unique to the Southwest with respect to the, the epilogue or the, or the mythology. As Raiden point, pointed out in 1948 and 1949, the hero twins mythology is common to the Americas, mm -hmm. North, Central, and South. Okay. Could you email me some information on that and some references? Uh, yeah, I'm working with a few other people right now um, to put together um, kind of a package uh, <laughs> with uh, the distribution, right? Uh, people sort of forgot about Raiden, I guess, uh, but he made a very good point. He described it as uh, the hero twins are known from Canada to Tierra del Fuego and from the Atlantic to the Pacific. Interesting. And that's pretty impressive. <laughs> yeah. You know, and Thank now you. that you mentioned it, that, that kind of relates to, you know, the modern Adam who are considered descendants of Hohokam, because according to their origin stories, there were two creator deities. Uh -huh. in culture. Yeah. yeah. Thanks again. Never, that was a good presentation. That. Yeah. Thank you, Mark. Uh, By the way, Mark was the ins inspiration for this talk <laughs> several years ago. Um, Angeline's, uh, I thought she was un unmuted, but she's muted again. The Kumiyai also have hero twins. Custom Sho is one. The Navajo also have them. Well, <laughs> Practically all of the Pueblos do, and I think as Al might have mentioned, um, their living uh, representatives are are the uh, the war twins. of the of the warrior twins. Yeah, yeah. are are like the the war captains or war chiefs, and most right. Pueblos have two of those. Not all of them, but most of them do, right? So it's it's endemic, and um, probably originates with uh, people coming out of Beringia. That's how That's old it's, yeah, we're talking about really a uh, deep structure, fundamental mythology hmm. that, that becomes um, ethnically distinct, um, not through diffusion, but uh, simply- diversification. Exactly, exactly yeah. right, yeah. And that's the project um, that we're working on right now, especially with a couple of guys from the Southeast. Um, there are- all kinds of depictions of the twins, as well as, here's a good word for you, sinistrality. <laughs> Left-handedness. Left-handed, yes. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> That's very, very prominent. And, and it all revolves around duality. Huh. Yeah, I'll look forward to your research on that. <laughs> one, one connection with that, as, I mean, when you're talking about ritual and ceremony or moving around the fire, there's also a difference in the direction 
that different groups will move. They'll, they'll move, you could say, left-handedly around the circle in one direction, or other cultures might move right-handedly around, around the circle. There's also that connection. Mm -hmm. All right, we have no more questions in the chat feature. So we're happy with our program. I want to, uh, all you that have hung out this far, um, thank you for attending and keep in touch with the Atslander and the Atslan ESERV and all of Mike's uh, uh, sites that you can get information of upcoming Zooms and even recordings of past Zooms. There's so much out there but we, we truly are thankful for your participation tonight and we hope you enjoyed the show. And thank you, Art. I'm, I'm really impressed, <clears throat> not only with your programming skills, but also with your communicative skills. I mean, that newsletter you put out is, you must spend hours doing that, hours and hours. That's amazing to me. I'm, it really- uh, For each one, I spend a, a few hours. <laughs> Fortunately, it's only sure, for sure. <laughs> <laughs> All right, this Ooh. has been a great program, everybody. Thank you, Al. Thank you, Michael. And well, thank you, Mike. Thank you, Jim. Thank you, everybody, for attending. I really enjoyed it. Okay. We'll see you soon. All, All right. right. Thanks, everybody. Bye-bye.